Okay, we might get started. The, these are the uh, people with real stamina. You've survived, to, you've made it to the end of the conference. We've got lightning talks to come, but this is the last official uh, speaking slot sessions. So uh, well done, everyone, and uh, let's finish on a hopefully interesting uh, note. This, this talk's looking at another data science problem. It's um, whiskey clustering. So it's all about grouping similar things together. Um, and in particular, I want to look at how you might scale that. And I'm going to use, uh, uh, have a look at it's a glimpse of how you might use some uh, Apache big data projects to do some scaling of, of algorithms. For the particular data set we've got, we don't need to scale this problem at all, but it's a problem that you can easily have a look at. All the code examples, they're all uh, you, you can run these through Gitpod or uh, download them on GitHub and run them yourselves, or uh, s several of them you can run um, front ends at least on uh, through Jupyter Notebooks. All the slides and the, um, the code is, is all available. So just a very, very quick sales pitch of, of Groovy. It happens to be very, very good for, for doing, uh, it's sort of like the Python of the JVM world. It's um, got some dynamic features that sometimes mean the code is uh, simpler than you might otherwise have, and um, it's got a bunch of other features that make some data science things uh, really cool, and we'll have a quick look at it. Um, three and a half billion downloads since it was created. Uh, the artifacts have been downloaded. It's got a lot of contributors, but we are certainly very keen for more contributors, so please come along to uh, the, the Apache project, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, chat to folks. Now, if I was giving an elevator pitch of what are some of the good things of, of Groovy compared to if, if I want to go pick, I've got other options that are great as well these days. Java's um, got excellent functionality. We've got Kotlin, we've got Scala, we've uh, got a few, few various options. These are some of the things that I, where I think uh, Groovy actually um, is better than some of the other languages in, in, for certain scenarios. It's got simpler scripting. It's got a whole bunch of really useful methods for, for doing a, a bunch of stuff. It's got flexible typing, so you can have very, very dynamic typing if you want, or you can have much stronger than Java typing if you want. And it's all extensible, so you can decide how, what, if you want to um, make the compiler do uh, different things, you can make it do that. It's got a few things in there that are, um, if you do a lot of OO design, that's going to make your life a lot easier. And if you do a lot of functional programming, there's a whole lot of things that'll make your life easier as well. There's a whole a stack of 80 or more AST transforms that mean you're instead of having thousands of lines of Java code, you might have tens of lines of code. And if you're seeing lots, if you're getting feedback of all the latest features that are coming out in you know, Java 21, 22, 23, you can probably get the exact same equivalent feature, you're often with the exact same syntax that Java's uh, offering in the later versions back in JDK 8 with, with Groovy if you want. Okay. This is a really trivial example. I, I haven't got time to give you a, a groovy tutorial, but if you go and grab the latest JDK 2.23 early access versions, which so the ones that will be coming later this year, JDK 23 will be released, and you switch on all the preview modes, you can have fairly small scripts like this, but you can go back to um, the year 2000 or something, go, go and jump on JDK 1.5, and you can have uh, really small scripts uh, as well. If you're doing some testing, so this, this, here we've got a list of three things. We're going to uh, pick out all the ones that are of, where the strings are of size three. Um, that's what we're doing here. We're going to write some tests now. We've got some things. We've got a, a, a list of strings and a list of lists. And we're going to pick out the, the we're going to count the things of size three. Um, so here we've, we've uh, going to see that for the, for the cat, dog, and bird, cat and dog are three uh, characters in length, so we're going to pick out, there's going to be two of those, and we've got three lists, one, two, three, four, five, and six, so only the middle one, three, four, five, is of length three, so we're expecting to count one of those. Um, I can cut and paste that same code into Groovy, and it runs exactly, it's happily to run that exactly as it is, or I can uh, make it a bit more compact if I want. Um, here I'm using a bit of duct typing, which means I only need to write one uh, size of method, uh, and uh, it's much more compact. I'm using some range notation there as well. You, you can decide if you do or don't want to use that. If you get into Groovy, I'd recommend going looking at Spock. It, it has a whole lot of features for doing tests, including a sort of data-driven style, so I can rewrite that script in a test suite, and I might do it this way so that I can start adding more things in here that I want to check the size of. 
here's some, we're going to look, if I look at matrix uh, calculations, if I go and grab Apache Commons math, and I want to just, I've got, I've got two matrices I'm going to define, and I'm going to do uh, one of them to the power of two, which is multiplying by itself, and then I'm going to multiply it by the other matrix I, I declared. Um, I can write it like this, and the, the result come, pops out the bottom here. Um, or I can, in Groovy, I can uh, write it like that, and it's the exact same library call. I'm using the exact same library, exact same library calls, but that's the code I need to write, and that's the result I get because the, the Groovy console is extensible. So you can, when it produces a matrix here, you can display it as a JLATEC generated uh, graphical representation if that's what you want. Some of the extension methods that, are, again, the sort of out of the box functionality to make things better. So, all the things you think of, all the th uh, functionality that's available in the streams library, we also give you that for arrays. And um, you don't need, often there's, it stays as arrays and there's no need to do boxing. So, if it's a primitive int, it doesn't need to go back to a, a large int to run compare and then go back to a primitive int or anything like that. And many of the uh, kinds of things you want to do when you're doing sort of map filter reduce style processing. Uh, in, in many data science applications can make use of these extra st stuff that we've added and, and can be a lot, lot faster. Um, as you can see here, Groovy's uh, pretty much the same speed as, as Java. This, in the, the green code there, I've turned on compile static. If I turn that off, Groovy would be a bit slower than Java. But when I, when I need the speed, I can just flick that on as long as I'm not doing anything super dynamic. Um, and if I go and use the array stuff, it's much, much faster still. The overheads of setting up streams outweighs the, um, the the flexibility that it gives me. I love streams, but there's times when I can be faster. Now, what's what's clustering? So I did a talk earlier on classification. Classification is grouping things where they've got a label. So I can group things into red wine and white wine. Um, what about grouping things where there is no uh, label? So um, in this room, if I was going to compare everyone's hobbies, there'll be people who you know, uh, might like reading books or watching movies or drinking whiskey or um, going jogging, whatever your hobbies might be. Um, now, I want to relationships between the people in the room. And you know, visually, I'm thinking, well, all the joggers would be one group, but they, are they the same as all the people who like movies or are they different? Or, but there's no, I can't sort of put a label that corresponds to that whole, you know, whole groups of people in there. They're just a, a multi-dimensional space. There might be 10 different hobbies or 100 different hobbies. And all of us in this room will be in different parts of that multi-dimensional space. How do I group the things in there? And there's no sort of labels there that sort of say all the people that like movies end like this and do that and whatever, it's, they're just there and I can sort of see all oh, these ones are all clustered. What's, what's the reason behind that? So clustering is um, all about finding those, those groups. And this is when you're doing market segmentation, recommendations, search groups, you know, when you do a search thing and you group results, uh, social network analysis of, so in your um, social media networks and so on, medical imaging, all of these things are, are places where you um, want to do this sort of clustering. And yep, it's just about grouping things together like this. So it's it's not unrelated to when we were, for those who were in the classification talk, but it's there's no labeling of any kind. So in the previous one, I had different classes of flowers. There's no classes here for the, the different kinds of things that we're going to be looking at. We're just going to mathematically find things that are, are closely related. And if I go get it, again, I'll get Apache Commons math. Um, it, even in their documentation, they show you how to do some of these things and um, what, what the implications are. Here, they've just generated some uh, data points. So they generated some data points in, in two concentric circles with a bit of random noise added. And they said, let's try to group those into things that are common. Now, some of the algorithms for doing this grouping do things like distance measures. Right, so if we're grouping all the people in this room, I'm, I might go and pick two points, and then it'll be all the people closest to that point are in one cluster, and all the people close to another point are in another cluster. Um, and d depending on what the data is, it, that might be a really bad idea to do it that way, or it might be a really good idea. And de also, depending if I pick, you, you typically pick a number of clusters that you're trying to group things in to sort of guide these algorithms. Some of the algorithms will determine the number of clusters themselves, other ones. They'll just do whatever you say. Other ones will, um, you can guide them in a certain direction. So if I pick two clusters, you know, maybe 
this, is, this says, oh, yep, there's two groups there, there and there. But we probably, you know, human, a human would visualising this is, there's probably three groups there. Um, so th you need to have a bit of smarts when you're applying the algorithms and you need to pick certain algorithms do better at certain kinds of things. So a lot of the algorithms when you're doing uh, clustering are, use distance measures, but some use density measures. So the DB scan, you can see over the far right column there, it's got a, you know, our human in, you know, intuition tells us that it did a better job of clustering the, the things that are there, probably, um, than, than what some of these other ones are doing. So there's a, there's a few things that we might want to think about. Let's have a look at what uh, k-means does, and it's a, one of the distance-based measures. So we have our data points. We guess k um, points at random. And we'll, we'll start off there. Now, uh, we're going to do an iterative process if your random points aren't that good. So if I picked here and here are going to be my two initial random points, um, nearly everyone is going to be in one of my clusters. And, and Sergio here might be in his own cluster. And if on my next point's here, everyone else is going to be in the same cluster here. And if I iterate over again and again, I'm, I may not get a good result. So there's, there's some um, stuff that you can do to try to make better guesses at these random points and so on. But these algorithms are sensitive to certain kinds of things. And depending on the number of iterations you do, you may not get out of a place where you're in a, in, in a bad uh, cluster. But let's, let's look at how it works normally. So we've, we've picked, you know, hopefully, reasonably good uh, in initial starting points, the, the, the points we've got here. And what we do is we go and assign the points to the closest uh, centroid that we've created. So all these, these ones get associated to here and so forth. And now that we've labeled them, we throw away the old centroid and uh, move, move it to based on the... So these are my, now my points in this cluster. I work out the centroid of, of those points, and that becomes the new centroid for the next round of iteration. And so we just sort of move that, and you just keep going, repeating those steps. And eventually, you find that it either stabilizes, or you give it a maximum limit of iterations. And you just say, yep, once I've done this 10 times, that's, I'm just going to go with what it is. Because sometimes, um, if, this, if this point's pretty close to being in, in the middle of these two, it can just oscillate. Boom, 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 and it never actually stabilizes. Um, so you often will just say, yeah, stop once you've done it 10 times or something like that. Um, let's cluster some whiskies. So this is, again, a classic um, data science problem that's been around for quite a while. It's, uh, there's 86 whiskies, and again, there's been a lot of extensive research that I've done uh, in preparation for this, uh, this talk. Um, what does the CSV file that we're, we're going to read in and do stuff with? It's got a distillery name, it's got a row ID, and then it's got all of these different uh, categorizations of whiskey uh, flavoring things. So there's body, sweetness, smoky, medicinal, and so on, all the way up to floral. And so people have gone and drunk all these wines, and they say, hmm, that's about a four on the floral, or this one's very smoky, and, or I can't taste any smoke on this one, so it gets a zero or whatever. So they get between a zero and a four on all these ratings. And this has all gone together, and you can sort of go and visualize them in various different ways. With all of those dimensions, it's, it's actually very hard to visualize. So when you're doing a, a 2D graph, if it was just X and Y, if it was just body and sweetness, I could plot all the points on XY graph, and then I could like even draw straight lines through it or whatever it might be. But to, to do body, sweetness, and smoky, I've got to go X, Y, and Z. To do body, sweet, sm sweetness, smoky, and medicinal, oh, I need another dimension. OK. Um, well, I can add time to it, or I can change the color. So we could, we, could, we, could, um, we could do that in this room. If we were sort of, we could have X, Y coordinates. And then, uh, then I'm going to tell you, OK, well, the people who get a four for smoky, you've got to hold your bottle right up. And the people who got a zero, you hold your bottle right down. And, oh, OK, we need another column. Oh, tie a yellow ribbon around it if you've got a four, and tie a blue ribbon around it. And we're going to do more and more things to try to visualize it and sort of send your brain. To get all of these, just forget it. It's just too, too many things for the human brain to try to look at all the relationships that are going on here. So we're going to look at a way to overcome that problem as well uh, shortly. But let's just go and have a look at uh, what we can do. We'll use Apache Commons Math, Apache Commons CSV. We'll read this thing in. We'll go and look at our, our features, other thing across the top. So it's the first um, 
first row and we'll, we'll, we'll um, skip the first two columns, we'll do all the yellow columns, so that's two to the end. We'll get the data, which is not the header row, so it's one to minus one, which is the last one, and we'll collect all that as, as uh, ints in this case. Um, the distilleries is just that one column, so we'll go and grab that. Grab our data. Inside Apache Commons Math, there's a k-means cluster. There's actually three or four uh, different Libraries very, very similar, but k-means++ plus plus is, is, a, is a good one to go use. We're going to create one of those, give it the data, and um, go and get it to go and cluster everything. And there's, bit, there's various things I can get it to do. I can go and get it to predict what things are and see whether they match what... what um, well, there's no... don't match anything, but... Um, I'll go and I'll go and show you some some different cluster things in a minute. Here I'm printing out what's known as the centroid. So it's the thing that was in in this. It's I'm d after we've done all of our iterations, I'm just going to spit out where those are. And so that kind of gives you an indicative point in this multi-dimensional space of one of the clusterings. Okay. And the the idea would be now if you if you've had a whiskey and you really like it, um, you might go and try to find something else that's close to that your that dot that's in this groupings. And if you don't like it, you'd go somewhere else. Or if you want to try something different, you'd go somewhere else. And, and um, you're in this multi-dimensional space, so you've got lots of different ways you could traverse. Um, where are we up to? This one. So the, here's my centroids. I've just gone and printed those out. And um, I can do a, f a few graphs. Oh, so there's another concept as well as um, centroids. There's a con except called medoids. It doesn't really matter. It's, just, it's for us, but um, it's the... Uh, th these are a, a virtual point just in the middle of that multidimensional space. This is the closest actual one closest to that centroid. So it's gone and found the... Um, so it's the best representative out of that cluster. So it's sort of the average flavorings of all the ones that are related. And so we can print those out and we can do pretty graphs and things. And up there, we've converted into a sort of two, two and a half dimensional space. The colouring, even though that's sort of a dimension, is the clusters. But what I've... To fit it 2D, we've gone the X and the Y and we've added bubble size as a sort of a way to get a third dimension in that space. You, you could do that in 3D and have bubbles in 3D and get a fourth dimension. How did I go from the um, all the... the 12 dimensions down to the uh, three in this case. We use a thing known uh, principal component analysis. And it takes things in higher dimensions and converts them into lower dimensions, trying to preserve the maximum amount of information. Okay, And what it, it in, you end up getting things where you can see them. Oh, yeah, I can see that all the blues are sort of grouped and the yellows are sort of grouped and so on. So it's, it's, it does a good job of uh, presenting these things, but there's no... You can't... When, as you're moving up or down or across this graph, you don't know is, is sweetness increasing or decreasing, is body increasing. You, you could probably work it out for maybe, but it's, it's a mathematical com co combination that's um, tried to pick the things that... Um, minimize the loss of information as you lose the dimensions, as you reduce the dimensions. And um, we can do fancy things, trying to work out the best number of clusters. I won't go into the details, but here, here we've gone and drawn some different graphs, picking different numbers of clusters. And there's a thing known as an elbow um, rule, if you like. And this point here where you can see that kink is, is kind of known as the place where that's probably the uh, three is probably the place to stop in terms of you know if you try to do too many clusters we get that you know when oh was it, those who were in the previous talk there was some overlapping if you try to get too many clusters out of this there's sort of quite a bit of overlapping happening here and does these do these clusters really mean anything so three is what this graph is telling us where that kink is um there are examples showing all different kinds of... So I showed you k-means. There are other distance-based measures and other um, options, some that um, work out the number of clusters that they think you should be using, some that uh, do it based on what um, you're specifying and 
they're using different ways to do the measuring or different techniques. So you can go and look at all the different ones. And um, some of the libraries let you visualize in multi, you know, three dimensions and so on, and I can even have different sized bubbles and get a fourth dimension. And the big blobs in there are the centroids. So you can sort of see where the centroid is and then all the, the related ones around it. And there are other ways, rather than just distance measures, you can do things like try to put them in uh, dendrograms, in sort of hierarchical groupings. So you can think of, if you're doing beers or something, you might have your IPAs and your lagers or whatever, and then you might have fruity and non-fruity, or whatever they might be, and they'll all sort of pop down into sort of different things like that. And they get, let you uh, also do clustering. Right, so we want to scale this, and I've got uh, 10 minutes to cover an hour's worth of discussion about different data, big data things, but oh, we, we'll get there. Um, let's just think about this. So the clustering algorithm, I showed you the k-means. In order to work out, you know, one of the steps was calculate my distance from all the other points. Oh, okay, so we just need all the data on all the machines. Oh, hang on, that doesn't seem like a, a good way to scale problems. So it looks, at first glance, this algorithm, maybe this algorithm can't be scaled. Well, you just tweak it a bit, and what they do, you, you spread the data across your, your different machines. In, uh, now, you'd normally call the different uh, nodes here um, clusters or something. I'll try to call them nodes or try to call them parallel compute farms or something. So I've got clustering and I've got clusters, but they're different things. So I might have two compute nodes, and I'd put half the data on here and half the data on there, and I'd do, uh, use the algorithm that I'm going to talk to you uh, about. And if you do a reasonably good job of splitting the data roughly evenly, this works really well. If you don't do a good job of splitting the data, each one, each node may get vastly different centroids, and then this algorithm don't, doesn't reveal useful information for many, many iterations. So how, what, what do we do? We, we just perform the, the process that I showed you earlier on each node, and we get the centroids. Now we share the centroids uh, back to some sort of aggregation point. We combine them, and then we uh, spit them back, and we repeat this process. Now, the, th the motivation here is I've got a very small amount of information that I'm uh, sending across this thing rather than trying to send all the, the whole data across all, the, all, all over the place. And uh, that's, that's the process you could do if you were doing this manually. And it, for the, the big data uh, frameworks that we're going to talk about that supply you with something, that's what they're doing for you on your behalf. So you don't need to see any of that. You, you treat them like they were the library that we were just doing, which was all running on one machine, and they will be doing th this algorithm or, or a slight variation of this algorithm underneath the covers. So we can use Apache Ignite. It has a, um, so you go look up the doc. Whenever you're looking for how to, does this work with Groovy? And you might think, I don't see Groovy mentioned anywhere. If you see Java mentioned anywhere, Groovy just works straight for that. So you go and grab the, the Java docs. And th you'll see that there's also an ML library. And oh, this one has a k-means. Yep, it's going to do uh, dis distribute it across an I I Ignite uh, compute farm. You want to call it cluster. <laughs> um, and uh, do that algorithm for you. So what's the code look like? Again, we go and select the regions that we saw before. We pop our Ignite um, cluster up, <laughs> our compute node up, and we create a little, few little helper methods. We start it all up, run the k-means trainer, then fit it on our data. So we're going to feed the same data back in not, not great from a data science point of view, but that's what we're going to do. And it comes out with the clusters. Okay. Um, extra step if, uh, for, ex for bonus points, we can go and uh, we want to go to all the data points now and see what ranking that they had. And they're all sitting out on all the, all the different uh, nodes. So we've got to do a scan query, and we've got to pull that information back in. So there's a separate step here that we're doing. Which if you only needed the centroids, you wouldn't need to do this. But if you want to go and do uh, allocate to the clusters, we can do this extra step. And um, this shows you the results of that. The, what I used in the previous slides, I'm just sort of highlighting the same code again, on uh, Euclidean distance, which is one distance measure. There are other distance measures. This is actually typically used in classification more than clustering. But um, if, if it's something that's relevant to you, you can go and use it. And you can go and use, instead of k-means, you can use other types of algorithms that they've implemented that do this distributed stuff as well. 
Spark. It has, again, a... Um, so it's, it's a uh, thing we can do in, in multi-nodes, and um, it's got a k-means already provided for us. So we can go and create one of their k-means things. We use a vector assembler to get our data in a form that we can set, put it, uh, inject into that node, node farm and get our result by transforming the data set, and it comes back, and here, we, here we've got the data. So all of this, all the uh, magic is all sort of transparent at this point. So Apache Wang is, um, we could give a whole tutorial on that and describe it, what, it's, what its feature set is, but it tries to hide away. So we just, I just showed you Spark. Um, Ignite's not one of the supported frameworks, but the, the different kinds of frameworks are supported by Wang, and it tries to hide the distinction between those frameworks away from you. So we're going to jump in here and use Wang. Um, not yet released is a thing that's going to do it all for us, like we saw for, for the Ignite and, and Spark. I'll show you how that works, but it's not in a release yet. But we can just go and do that, uh, that algorithm. It's just doing k-means in each node and then sharing the, the nodes. We can go and do that. Um, the implication for this, and when we see Beam, it'll be the same thing. Because it's going, this information is going, uh, 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 it's being shared across um, the compute farm, the nodes, we want to make everything serializable and stuff like that. So each framework will have its requirements in order to, for it to go and move your stuff, your data or your algorithms ac across these nodes. So we'll see that we need to make some stuff serializable, but we can just use the basic raw map filter reduce type functionality that Wang provides to write the algorithm ourselves, And that's what we'll do to start with. So we've got some things here that we need to make serializable. Um, they're just records, and that'll be an emulated record if you're running on earlier JDKs. Um, we have a class that act captures the algorithm that we want. It needs to be serializable, so it's an extended serializable function. We create some pipeline apps that are going to do the things that we want, and here's where we do our uh, algorithm that's going to do our calculate, calculate, and we're iterating over that until we get to, um, what was our stopping point in this one here? We repeat, oh, just for a number of iterations in this, for this particular one. So sometimes it's just number of iterations. Sometimes we'll have a function that says, have I got to the point where it's stabilized? Um, if, if I have, I can exit early. We haven't got that here. We just do the iterations. So we go and uh, run that, and off we go, and it spits out all the answers. Okay. If you go and uh, you can just go build this yourself, just sp spit it into your uh, local Maven repo, and you can go and use the, the um, ML for all uh, functionality. It's got its own uh, k-means. So um, actually, yeah, so these are just um, I'll, I'll explain these, these two things in a minute. So instead of so when you go to ML for all, instead of having map filter reduce, it's got a more sophisticated uh, set of steps that it's uh, all of the ML algorithms have been put into a consistent set of steps. There's a, a transform step, a staging step, a compute op step, an update, a loop op step. Um, so all the algorithms, k-means and all these other things, all um, follow the same form. And, and it, so when it goes to Spark and when it goes to Flink and when it goes to these other... other um, uh, different engines underneath, it, it knows how to map these different stages. And we, we've gone and, on the previous slide, supplied two transforms. There's a built-in transform. We could, we could initialize this with zeros, and I wouldn't need to create this, and I could just use a, one that comes out of the box, but that's a bad thing for k-means to really initialize things. So I, do, I use random ones, and I've, I've got a slight a, a thing for doing a bit of extra transforming of my CSV file. Don't worry, need to worry too much about that. We feed that in, we just say go, and out comes the answer. So it becomes really, really easy, and here you can see I've, I've told the Wang engine, or the Wang context, or the whatever, that I may, uh, I want you to potentially do this with Spark, or potentially do it with a default Java runner, and it works, it optimizes which of those two is going to be better for my algorithm. Um, so, I can go and comment one of those out and force it to go on one of those, but here it's, it's going to do optimization planning for me and work out which one's going to be best. So I'm 
right on the end of time, but I think I've only got one left, so we'll let's quickly run through this. Uh, Beam is another model that tries to um, unify programming models. And again, we're going to need to do serialization stuff. We're going to roll by hand. So Beam's got an ML thing coming down the pipeline. And, um, it, I can go talk to Scikit and to TensorFlow and other things. I haven't tried to use them yet, so I did roll my own. I'm just using Beam like a sort of right procedure call uh, across a, a concurrent platform uh, environment. Create some points. They're the things I'm going to share. And um, I've got things for the, the, the Beam framework has functions that it knows it can share a, across this sort of environment. I'm going to create a few of those that, that sort of do the various steps, reading in the CSV, spitting stuff out, um, squashing things. You know how we, had, we got centroids and we had to make them a common one? So we've got steps for that. Um, steps that do the actual k-means calculation, um, assigning the clusters, and once we've done all those defined, we can just go and um, apply them all as, as, a, as a step of uh, things here. So there's a special per key thing that um, Beam provides that works really well for this particular algorithm, but otherwise we're just sort of stepping around in, in a loop. And that's pretty much it. The only thing I wanted to also show, um, oh, it's just the result. Um, if you want to use a tiny bit of um, Groovy metaprogramming, you can make the, the Groovy code look very much like the Python code that you'd use if you're using Python with Beam. Um, you, don't, you, don't, you wouldn't really ever need to do this unless you ha only had a team of Python pe folks and you were, you were trying to force them to go uh, use the Java framework. You could make it their life easy by doing this. Oh, actually, I forgot. I had Flink as well. Let's do the quick version of Flink. Um, won't describe it all, but it does have an ML library. Um, so Flink is more a streaming platform, but it does have k-means and everything there. We can go and uh, make use of that, and it spits out the right answers for us, so that's all good. But we're not really using k-means in a streaming fashion, so let's go and use a thing called online k-means. And this is a k-means that's updating itself at, over time as more streaming data is coming in, and there's things for decaying data and so on. So we can feed that in, and if we go and run that one, um, we, we can see we've, we've, we've got uh, just a subset of the data, um, and initially, um, so I'm only giving it a few points at a time, and I'm just giving it a few more points as we go along, um, using the extra points that come in to, to, to uh, classify the last... I, I split off um, six points. And as I'm using data to train a model, as, and I'm just using that model on the six points. And it starts off that it doesn't have a really good view of, of where the things are. They're sort of spread out. And as more data comes in, it turns out the six points I stripped off happen to be ones that were in that grouping, and it gets closer and closer to getting the right answer here. So we can use, we can use uh, k-means in a streaming environment as well. Okay, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.